Well, good evening. We greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and welcome you to the Lord's house as we close out this Lord's day together in worship. And before we do that, I'd like to remind you of just a handful of things happening here in the life of the body of Woodruff Road. Men's basketball is on tomorrow night. That's at 7 p.m. And Men of the Gates is still on hiatus with Pastor Dodds, and he plans to resume a Tuesday morning at 6.15, October 11th. He would love for you to join him. Regular Wednesday night activities this week with singing school, King's Kids, dinner, adult prayer meeting. We'll hear from former intern David Rios. He's going to be coming down from the swampland that is New York to be back in God's country here in South Carolina. So we're happy to have him back. You'll hear about what he's doing up there with his work in the OPC. And we'll give him a big Woodruff Road welcome. We're glad to see him back here with us. And please don't forget to RSVP for dinner to give Michelle and her wonderful kitchen crew a heads up to know how much lasagna to prepare for all of us. Uh, lastly, our annual missions conference is taking place October 14th and 15th uh, with the speaker being Reverend Roland Barnes. And please register if you plan on joining uh, for the catered dinner on the 14th. Again, just a couple of further events off, uh, just down the road to take note of. Our annual fall festival will be happening uh, Wednesday, October 25th at 545 here at the church building. And for our senior high students, a link to register for the upcoming fall retreat was sent out this past Friday. If you plan on attending, I would just encourage you please to use that link. Don't tell me, I forget most things, if not all things. So don't tell me, register on the link. We're gonna be headed to Awanata Valley, October 27th through the 29th for a time of fun and fellowship as well. As encouragement from God's word is our speaker, is Reverend Braden Benson, who's joining us all the way from Auburn, Alabama that weekend. If you have any questions at all about the retreat, please again, just come see me after the service. If you're visiting with us here this evening, we are indeed delighted that you've chosen to worship with us here at Woodruff Road. We'd ask that you please fill out the blue card in the pew in front of you and place it in the offering plate when it comes by later in the service or hand it to one of us uh, in the Narthic so that we can greet you personally. On November 28, 1889, Dutch theologian Herman Bovink gave a lecture on Christian preaching to seminary students titled Eloquence, whereby of the Sabbath and specifically the Lord's Day and corporate worship, Bavink said, whatever influence there may be from the word in print or spoken that reaches us from elsewhere, it cannot be compared with the blessing there is for heart and life, family and society, and the words spoken to us in the gatherings of the congregation. Here alone do we find the ministry of God's word and the sealing of his covenant. Here Christ himself lives in our midst and our works by his spirit. Here we taste the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the principle of eternal life. Bavink concluded the Sabbath is best as the best of days. No other day is like it. And the church is the meeting of God's people with his people. No other gathering can take its place to compensate for its loss. Let's prepare our hearts to worship our triune God this evening.
This evening, God calls us into worship from Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 11. The Lord will be awesome to them, for he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship him, each one from his place, indeed all the shores of the nations. Let's now respond to the Lord's call to worship by standing and taking your Trinity Psalter hymnals and turning to Him 222, which is, O God, our help in ages past, based off of Psalm 90. Please take your worship, God, as we now come before the Lord to publicly confess our faith together, and we'll do so using one of the most important Christian creeds ever written, the Nicene Creed. So, Christian, what do you believe? We
Please remain standing and take your copy again of God's word, turning with me to the New Testament as our reading this evening comes from Jude chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. This is God's holy and an errant and authoritative word to us this evening. Pay careful attention. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for his condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of God Be seated. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, we see... The Apostle Paul thanked the Philippian church for their generous financial gifts that helped to support his missionary endeavors. This evening as we give, let us give cheerfully, remembering that God in his word tells us that he indeed loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray. Our Father, how we thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word, Lord, and in doing so you've instructed us on how we, as your blood-bought people, are to worship you, the living and true God. So help us now, Father, to worship you with cheerful and obedient hearts as we lay before you these tithes and offerings, that which belong to you, Father, trusting that you will use them to bring about your glory. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
Please pray with me. Almighty God, we come to you this evening humbly acknowledging your power and your glory, your goodness and your grace, your holiness and your righteousness. There are no gods like you, not in your glory, not in your wisdom, not in your kindness, nor in your justice, Lord. You stand alone above all gods. You are the one true and living God, giving life and light to men, revealing yourself by your word and power, doing awesome deeds and working wonders. We praise you this day for the kindness of your choosing and electing love, Father. You are the one who called Abraham, making a great nation from one so small. You preserved him and gave him a seed and made promises to him. You gave him children and multiplied them as the stars of heaven. You called them by name and out of your name came upon them. And when they needed rescuing, Lord, you were there. We confess with them, O Lord, that no other deeds compare to yours. You spoke to them. Out of the midst of the fire, you took a nation for yourself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all of which you did, Lord, in Egypt before the eyes of your people. In the days of Jesus, he came to his own, though he did not uh, know yet receive him, yet from those who were lost and dying in the world, you chose disciples, you called them to yourself, immersefully taught them and trained them and equipped them with the gospel of grace. And you sent them out into the world. By your spirit, they cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick, and you, you healed them. But when you called them, not many were wise according to worldly standards, not many were powerful or of noble birth, but you chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. You chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. You chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in your presence. And because of you, we are in Christ Jesus, who came to, uh, became to us wisdom from you, Father, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that we may boast in you, O Lord. O Lord, we thank you that you not only uh, rescue, but you sustain and preserve your people. You haven't left us to ourselves, but you have sent your spirit to dwell in us. You have made us into one body and one holy temple. You have made us a royal priesthood and a holy nation. You have called us living sacrifices. You have set us apart to be vessels used for noble purposes. You have declared our end even now that having begun a good work in us, Lord, you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so, Father, we look now to your gracious hand. We look to you crying out, Abba, Father, as your adopted children and him having received the spirit of adoption and access to the throne of grace as our Father who can provide as you've provided for our forefathers, those heirs of everlasting salvation. From faith, Lord, we ask you for more faith. We ask you for hearts so changed and overcome by your spirit that goodness and praise and thanksgiving forevermore be what comes spilling out of our mouths. We ask you for that holiness without which no one will see you, Lord. We plead with you, for hearts that are near to you, that worship you in substance. O Lord, that our doctrine would be true, that we would not be defiled from within, that we would have compassion as you have compassion. We plead with you for wisdom to know and to do your will at all times, to think your thoughts after you, to set our minds on things above where Christ is seated in the heavenly places. O Lord, make us have faith like those of children. Let us be humble before you. Let us deal radically with sin. Make us ready to forgive as well as restore, and let us be found faithful, Lord. Father, you are worthy of all these. Your Son and our Savior deserve such obedience in our hearts and in our lives. And your Spirit is sufficient to enable us to do these things and to live lives pleasing unto you, O Lord. And we ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand as we reverence the Word of God again. Take your copy of his word and turn with me to Joshua as we'll be reading chapter 7 in its entirety. This too is God's holy and errant and authoritative word to us this evening. Pay careful attention. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things for Achim, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Sarah, 
of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and will cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things, and have both stolen and deceived. And they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed things from you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to the families. And the family which the Lord takes shall come by households. And the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord. And because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes. And the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah, and he took with him the Zerahites, and he brought with the family the Zerahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought the household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are hidden, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent. And there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And they took from them the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all of Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Acre. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones. And they burned them with fire, after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Acre to this day. This is the word of the Lord. As we remain standing, take your Trinity Psalter hymnals and turn with me to hymn 400. As we'll sing, Gracious Spirit, dwell with me.
the sermons we'll preach over the next few Sunday nights out of Joshua 7 will be some of the most important in the history of Woodruff Road because we'll be looking at a primary foundational principle from the Word of God about how to deal with corporate indwelling sin in the church. This isn't just something that has implications for individuals as we'll see tonight. It has implications for the entire body, the future of the body, the health and well-being of the body. Now, I hope you have your Bible open to Joshua 7, and this is one of those sermons, like this morning was sort of a spoon-fed sermon, one verse, you could, didn't have to turn a single page. But tonight, we're going to be looking at several texts, and we're going to range far and wide, Old and New Testament, and so you're going to have to do a little bit of work. And the context for Joshua 7 is, of course, Israel has been delivered by a mighty hand out of Egyptian bondage. They've wandered in the wilderness, been preserved by the grace of God for 40 years, and now they've come into Canaan by God's mighty hand. They are in the promised land. And they've come to the first city in Canaan where they've had a great and mighty victory by God's sovereign assisting hand. The city of Jericho has been wiped out. Confidence is running high through the camp. The people get presumptuous and arrogant and feel invincible. And the unthinkable is about to happen. We're going to see it soon. We won't look at it tonight, but a defeat. A defeat for the people of God. And when we ask and answer the question, why, we'll be instructed tonight and over the next few weeks. And the answer, of course, is always and only sin. We're going to need the help of the Holy Spirit because there are going to be all kinds of things in this text that you'll want to put up roadblocks, barriers to hearing this truth. And so we need the help of the Holy Spirit to break through those barriers that we will even by our flesh erect. Let's ask for that help now. O God of all grace, how dull and lifeless and powerless we are apart from your Holy Spirit. We plead now for the, the ministry of the blessed Holy Spirit that we might preach rightly and hear rightly. Give us the grace of both faith and repentance tonight, and the grace of understanding. Press the truth home to our minds and to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll look at Joshua 7 with me, we'll need to see the whole context at once, and then in coming weeks we will dissect it and see the elements of the story. Again, Joshua 7 is one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible for an understanding, a proper understanding of sin, especially in its corporate nature. Now, it's meant to be understood as a narrative or a story. It's obviously absolutely true, historically accurate, but it's also a story, and an amazing story. And we need to be reminded of how to interpret a text like this. There are biblical principles that we should be reminded of, especially in Old Testament narrative. And the first is, we should always, whenever we're reading an Old Testament narrative, we should look for the history of redemption unfolding. And we see this as early as Genesis 3.15, where we see the principle that God's plan of redemption is going to reveal a Savior that's promised for us. We see this over and over again, this idea of the history of redemption. We see it in Jeremiah 31, where we have the promise of a new and better covenant. We hear in Isaiah 53 the the promised suffering servant who is to come, the Lord Jesus. In Psalm 22, we hear him crying out prophetically a thousand years before the fact, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as we read any Old Testament narrative, we see a record of God's promises and fulfillment as they unfold. It's necessary when we open any Old Testament text to see the covenant of grace being set forth, delineated, spelled out. And it's important to see all those typological pictures of Jesus and all the preparation for a Savior and behold with wonder God's purposes of grace. There's a second principle that should drive any reading of any Old Testament narrative. We're also being taught by the Old Testament how to live. We're instructed, yes, I said by Old Testament text, how to live a life of godliness, holiness, purity, and ethics, a life that pleases God. Some of you are scratching your head and saying, did you say the Old Testament teaches us how to live? You mean we learn from the Old Testament how to live the Christian life? Absolutely, yes. Keep one finger here. I told you you'd have to work tonight. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. 
The Apostle Paul's a Jew writing to a largely Gentile congregation in Corinth. And I want you to see how Paul tells us to read the Old Testament. Again, this is Paul, a Jew, writing to largely a Gentile congregation. So it would be just like if he were writing to Woodford Presbyterian Church. And he's going to tell them how to read the Old Testament. Paul tells us that we have lessons for holy living. Paul begins in verse 1 and says, Brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that all our fathers... Now stop with me for just a moment. Paul's writing to a largely Gentile church in Corinth, and he says to these Gentiles, he says, I want to tell you about our fathers. He's talking about Old Testament believers. And Paul collapses this supposed stark division between Old Testament saints who are Jews and New Testament saints who are Gentiles. Paul says, listen to you Gentiles. I don't want you to be unaware that our fathers, these Jewish saints. And so Paul says there's no idea in his mind that there's some sort of ethical or dispensational distinction between these. He says those people who are the sons of Abraham, they're our fathers. And their lives, their history is our genealogy. Paul says, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. The rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples. Do you see what Paul says as he's writing to new covenant Christians? Paul says all these events that happened to Moses and Joshua and yes, Achan. These things became our examples as new covenant believers to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted after them. Then look at verse 11 very carefully in 1 Corinthians 10. All these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition. Paul says, whenever you read an Old Testament narrative, bring this principle to it. Don't say, oh, that's interesting, Joshua 7 is, but it has nothing to do with me. Paul says, no, this was written for us. They were written for our instructions so we can learn spiritual lessons of how God deals with his people. That's why Paul will teach the exact same lesson later when he's writing about the Old Testament. Paul writes in his last epistle in 2 Timothy 3, and he says there, all scripture, and of course he could only be speaking of the Old Testament, the New Testament canon was not established yet. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for reproof, rebuke, correction, and training in righteousness. In other words, we're not just to say, when we come to an Old Testament narrative, why, well, isn't that interesting? Isn't God's redemptive plan marvelous? We're to be spurred on by negative and positive examples to godliness. We're to learn how to live, and the principles contained in Joshua 7 are staggering, as we'll see over the next few Sunday evenings. You will see how weighty they are in terms of understanding the nature of the Christian life. Back to Joshua 7. I want us to begin very slowly and simply because we will, week by week, we will just go in deeper and deeper and deeper to Joshua 7. But let's begin slowly. Who was Achan? Who was this man? His name, and some of you parents will want to pick up on this. I suspect there will be some children called by this name this week because his name is Hebrew for trouble. That's what the word Achan means. In fact, notice the word play. Look at verse 25 in our chapter. What does Joshua say to Achan? And there's, again, this Hebrew word play going on. Joshua says to Achan, why have you Achaned us? The Lord will Achan you this day. That's literally what's being stated here because the name means trouble. And if there's anyone who's ever been aptly named, it's Achan. Because he brings great trouble and misery and despair upon the entire nation by his single acts. Now, something that you should understand, another truth as we begin to dig down beneath the surface, is who this man's family is. We've lost an understanding of this, but it is, it is principial to understand covenant theology. We think 
uh, I can know who you are just by knowing you. I can understand who you are apart from any understanding of your family, but the scriptures don't teach us to think that way. In fact, this text will confront our individualism in many ways. We will understand Achim by looking at who his family is. And we'll see there's a principle that we should learn. If you want to understand somebody, we can't know them apart from understanding their covenantal history. We can't know them apart from knowing their parents, grandparents, and in Aiken's case, about four generations back. What's their history been? Look at verse 1. What does the Holy Spirit begin to tell us who Aiken is? He doesn't just say, there's a man named Aiken who popped up on the scene. Because that wouldn't be covenantal. It wouldn't be true. It wouldn't be in keeping with the covenantal way that Scripture teaches us to view persons. And what we get treated to in verse 1. Notice the first thing we're told about Achan is his family. In fact, several generations of his genealogical history. But what we are told there is filled with these moments of, oh, so that's who Achan is. I get it. I understand why he's like that. Look at what we read in chapter 7, verse 1. Achan is the son of Carmi, the grandson of Zabdi, the great-great-grandson of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. You're saying, just a bunch of guys' names. I don't get it. Well, there's at least one name that ought to leap off the page at you there. Look at verse 1. Achan is in the line of Judah. And you think, oh, I get it. I see where this is going. There's going to be something here about Jesus, right? Jesus is of the line of Judah. We'll see Christ in this text. But what you find with Achan is he's almost the Antichrist. He's the one who covenantally brings cursing on his seed, whereas Jesus of the line of the tribe of Judah brings blessing. But that's not what we want you to see yet about Achan's heritage. Look a little closer. And now you're going to have to really roll up your sleeves and dig into Scripture. We see that Achan is the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the great-great-grandson of Zerah. Don't remember Zerah? Once you know who Achan is the great-grandchild of, you start scratching your head and you say, oh, this makes perfect sense. It all fits. We understand. Keep one finger here and look back at Genesis 38. And I want you to look at Achan's heritage. And in Genesis 38, you have an account of one of the most wicked deeds in all of Scripture, one of the most heinous, incestuous deeds. If it weren't in the Scripture, this couldn't even be discussed in polite company. Look at Genesis 38, beginning in verse 11. This is Achan's family. Genesis 38, verse 11 and following, Judah, Achan's ancestor, said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown, lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Now in the process of time, the daughter of Shelah, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shears at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adolamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, wrapped herself, set in an open place, which is on the way to Timnah, for she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife, as Judah had originally promised. <clears throat> when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot. This is his daughter-in-law, because she'd covered her face. He turned her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you. This is biblical euphemism. I'm going to try to be as discreet as possible here. This is biblical euphemism. He's asking if she'd be interested in sexual relations like you would a harlot. For he didn't know that this was his daughter-in-law. So she said, what will you give me that you may come into me? And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. So she said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? And he said, what pledge shall I give you? She said, your signet and your cord. In other words, his ring and your staff that's in your hand. Then he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by it. So she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adolamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he didn't find her. He asked the men of that place, saying, where's the harlot, who was openly by the roadside? They said, there's no harlot in this place. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. 
Also the men of this place said, there's no harlot in this place. Judah said, let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. I sent this young goat, and you've not found him. He came to pass about three months later after that. Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she's with child by harlotry. Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. When she was brought out, she sent her father-in-law, saying, by the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, please determine whose these are, the signet and cord and staff. So Judah acknowledged them and said, she's been more righteous than I because I did not give her to Sheila, my son, and he never knew her again. Now it came to pass at that time for giving birth that, behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was when she was giving birth that one put out his hand and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand saying, this one came out first. Then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out expectantly. And she said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand and his name was called Zerah. This is... Achan's forefather, Zerah, this child who was produced by an incestuous relationship, this child of harlotry is Achan's great-great-grandfather. Now let me show you how our text, look back at Joshua 7, and I want to show you something that when Pastor King read it a moment ago, you read right past it and didn't notice it. Look at Joshua 7, our text, and when this is all being confronted, we read of Joshua in Joshua 7, verse 24. So Joshua and Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah. Now you notice that he's not the son of Zerah. He's the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the great-grandson of Zerah. But what, when we want to look at his immorality and his deception, do you notice what the Bible does, what the Holy Spirit does? It says, oh no, you're the son of Zerah. You have the family traits. And what we see is, and listen carefully, because this principle is at the root of understanding Achan. What we see is immorality and deception being passed on to the third and fourth generation, the sins of the fathers being visited on the sons the principle stated in Exodus 34, that sin is transmitted. Another thing you should know about Achan, he's of the tribe of Judah. And as we already hinted at, he's an exact inversion of the one to come from the tribe of Judah. It's our joy to preach Christ anytime we can from any text we can. And what we see in Joshua 7 is you have the reverse image of Christ. Instead of the line of Judah, the one who comes and by his, the lion of Judah, the one who comes and by his holy work, saves a number that no man can number, you have the Antichrist in Achan. You have the pretender who comes from the line of Judah, but he doesn't save anyone. He only damns many. Think of what he does. Not only does his whole family die with them, he curses them, they are, they are executed with him. But because of his sin, over 30 men die in battle at Ai. And so what we see is this one who comes from the line of Judah brings no blessing. He should cause us to run away from him and to run to the real line of the tribe of Judah. Who only brings blessing to those who are in union with him. Another thing you should know about Achan when asking the question, who is he? I want you to step back and think about how staggering this is. Achan has an entire chapter of the word of God devoted to him, making him famous for one thing and one thing only, his sin. Apart from his sin, you would have never heard of him. Think about Peter. Peter's famous for his sin too, denying Christ. But if we'd never known of his sin, he'd still be famous. Or think about David. David is famous for his sin with Bathsheba, but if that never would have happened, he'd still be noteworthy. But here is Achan's legacy, a whole chapter, a lengthy discussion. He brings ruin and corruption and sin. There's an application for us. Some of you in thinking about what will be your legacy to your children and grandchildren. What will your grandchildren save you one day when you're buried and there's something written on your tombstone? Will your grandchildren say, oh, what a cursed 
legacy was passed on to me by this grandfather, this grandmother. They passed on a legacy of sadness and sin and destruction and lies. Or would they be able to say, he was a sinner saved by grace. This is one who lived the Christian life, fought the good fight of faith till the end. One who passed on a legacy of truth and righteousness and godliness. It's possible, of course, that I might be people speaking to people who only have one legacy. The terrible blot of transmitted sin that cripples your family, disgraces your name, and brings shame upon your family. My friend, I will tell you, we're going to talk about over tonight and over the next few weeks, secret sin. Secret sin that never remains secret. And so let me plead with you to think long term, to think what will my legacy be? What will my name mean? Will it mean troubler of the generations who follow? Or will it mean godly father and grandfather who passed on a legacy of righteousness? So what was Achan's sin? Look back at verse 1, chapter 7. And in verse 1, you have a condensed statement. The children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. That's the short version. That's the summary, the executive summary statement. Committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. What are we talking about? Well, look back a chapter. In fact, you can just look back across the page to Joshua 6, verse 18. When the children of Israel are getting ready to go into Jericho, they're told, you by all means, in 618, you by all means abstain from the accursed things lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. God gives them fair warning and says, don't take out of the city of Jericho the clothing, the gold, the silver. There are certain things that are reserved for the treasury of the Lord. Everything else is to be burned. Very clear instructions. But look at Joshua 7, verse 20 and 21. We have a more clear answer. What is Achan's sin? Look at Achan's testimony after he's been exposed in verse 21 of chapter 7. He says, I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment. Now what we're going to find out is this isn't just any robe, it's a ceremonial robe used in idolatrous worship of the Babylonian idols. Achan knows full well what it is, but he's attracted by its beauty. He picks it up. And then look at verse 21. He's busy. He also grabs 200 shekels of silver. He grabs hold of a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. And so he steals gold and silver. And perhaps you're going to say right now, this is just absolutely unthinkable. I can't think, I can't imagine that somebody would steal this way. These are things reserved for God. How could somebody rob God? But Malachi, in Malachi chapter 3, brings this up. And he says, will a man rob God? The whole nation of you are robbing God. Don't be self-righteous and look at Achan and say, I would never. Malachi said in his day, the entire nation was robbing God, not giving him the tithe. Well, Achan's sin is robbing God. It's a violation of the Eighth Commandment because he stole what was rightfully the Lord's. And we'll discuss the anatomy of his sin in weeks to come. But I want us to move hurriedly through the lessons we're to learn from this saga. And we'll see them throughout the scriptures in the New Testament as well. Let me point out five principles that we can learn from just the overview. And, and again, we, we have not even begun to dig down into the narrative. It will take several weeks to do that. The first principle that we're going to learn in Joshua 7 is this chapter reinforces the concept of the organic unity of God's people as opposed to individualism. If you're sitting there right now saying, Carl, you know, I've got my private sins. I've got my secret sin that I'm dealing with. But it doesn't really hurt anyone else. It's just my sin. My sin doesn't affect anybody else. Everybody else's sin doesn't affect me. My friend, you don't understand the Bible, this vital principle. And you've taken on the spirit of the age, which is hyper-individualism, and you've not understood the transmission of sin. Think of it on the positive side. In 1 Corinthians 12, 
Paul says, in the body, when one rejoices, all are to rejoice. The negative side, Paul says, when one member of the body hurts, all hurt. And what we see very clearly in Joshua 7 is that trouble comes on the whole nation of Israel, all three to four million of them, because of one man's sin. Any idea that says people live their lives as individuals, they're not connected, no, when you're part of the body and you sin, it hurts the whole body. And of course, the ultimate example of this is by the sin of one man. The entire race was plunged into death. We see the principle here. Here's Achan. The people of God are going to, to battle a few days after Jericho, after Achan's thievery. They're going to battle in Ai, and 30 men plus lose their lives. Tell me that Achan's sin is somehow disconnected with everybody else's life. There were 30 widows in the camp of Israel that night because of Achan's sin. Achan probably didn't even know those men who were killed or their wives. These men probably didn't even know Achan. They could have been from different tribes in Israel, and yet they die in defeat in battle because of this stranger's sin. And what this text teaches us, whether we want to kick against it or complain about it, what this text teaches us is the organic unity of God's people as opposed to individualism. And what we're going to learn as we dig in deeper in week to, weeks to come is you and I are being instructed to care deeply about the sanctification and the holiness of the people around you. Your life is inextricably linked to theirs. There's a second principle that we're taught by this narrative. This chapter teaches us that it's always sin and only sin that brings about God's wrath and judgment. God already told the people what would happen if they took the things under the ban. Look at chapter 6, verse 18 and 19. Stare at it carefully. God told the people of Israel what would happen if they took things under the ban, it would bring upon them judgment. It would bring trouble upon the whole camp. And Joshua 6, verse 18 and 19, is a prophecy, an advance warning that God will judge sin. And for those of you who are saying, well, you know, this is just an Old Testament concept. God doesn't judge sin anymore. Tell that to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. It's sin that brings about God's judgment. We see the principle here, and we see it in the New Testament as well. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, even at the Lord's table, there are many among you who are weak and sick and even die because you come to the table sinfully. There's a third principle that this narrative teaches us. And this saga instructs us, and we will go deep into this in Sunday nights to come, God willing. This saga instructs us on the process of sin. I don't know if you've figured this out, but this being Greenville County, we have more engineers per capita than any other county in the U.S. here. And what that means is you can rarely, if ever, have a, uh, a conversation with an engineer without the word process coming up. Some of you ladies who are married to engineers are saying, tell me about it. We have to have a process to make dinner to the husband I'm married to. Flow charts. And so... What we're going to see is the process of sin. How does sin look? How does it begin? How does it end? And this chapter is an engineer's delight because what you can do is you can chart a flow chart of sin. In fact, you can see it wrapped up in verse 21. Look carefully there where we see Achan stating, this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted, so track this, I saw, I coveted, and then I took them. Do you notice the process? Well, we read this when Achan is called out by Joshua and he confesses like an engineer. He talks about the process. He looks, he sees the gold and silver, he scoops it up, he buries it. He saw, he lusted after it, he took it. But there was something that happened before that, and we're going to find out. Discontentment and dissatisfaction. He felt like God hadn't provided well enough for him. 
I'm tired of these old raggedy clothes that have been through the wilderness for 40 years. I need a new robe. I need a, an attractive Babylonian ceremonial robe. Dissatisfaction turned into coveting. The opportunity is presented. He sees, he covets, he takes. Parents, do you recognize this at work in your children? Don't be so short-sighted as just to see the act and say, when you're standing in line at Walmart and you see them slip a pack of gum into their pocket and say, why did you steal that? Why did you take that from the store? Instead of just confronting the overt act, we need to recognize the anatomy of sin and trace it to its roots. What was behind that? Covening. What was behind that? What was at the root? A heart that hates God's commands. A heart that's discontent with God's provision. You see, sin always begins in the heart. It's always an issue of the heart. And what we see is Achan's heart spilling out. And when it finds the occasion, finds the moment, it sees a robe and some gold and silver, and that just comes naturally because that's what's in his heart. That's who he is. A fourth principle. This chapter is a vivid reminder that all secret sin will be brought to light. In a room of this number of people right now, there are people, probably several, who are holding, caressing secret sins. And they are absolutely convinced that nobody else knows about them. They think that they're the only ones, even their wife, their husband, their children, their parents, don't know about their secret sins, and they're convinced. I can have this sin, and it'll be my delight, and no one will ever know. Forgetting this basic principle that drove Achan. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. He sees all and knows all. Forgetting the principle of Hebrews 4 that says, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There are people right now in this room who are hiding sexual sin, financial sin, and still carrying those day by day. You tell yourself the lie, no one will ever know. That's what Achan did. No one will ever know. I've got it so securely hidden underneath my tent. No one will ever know. My friend, you've become a practical atheist. You've forgotten that God is omnipresent, that he's omniscient, that nothing can be hidden from him, and I would plead with you tonight. Learn Achan's lesson. All sin, sooner or later, is brought out into the light. All sin will be exposed. Some of you in the weeks to come, when we look at this process of the lot falling on this tribe and this family and it coming closer and closer until the whole nation of Israel, all three to four million, are looking at Achan and all three to four million are saying, you are the troubler of Israel. You're going to say, oh, I, I would just die. I'd be mortified of embarrassment. That's exactly what will happen on the last day. We're told in Matthew chapter 25 that all secret sin will be brought to light for all to see. And so if there's anything I would plead with you to do in our study, this very difficult study over the next few weeks, is don't play games with God. Don't confess one thing in public, but in private say, I can hold on to this secret sin. No one will ever know. No one except the living God. No one except the judge of all the earth. And so I'd plead with you. If the narrative teaches anything, it teaches us that God exposes secret sin. A fifth principle we will learn from this text, and I say it with sadness, but I have to tell the truth. This text teaches us there are always, always tares among the wheat. It teaches us that there are always Esau's among the Jacob's. Judas is among the disciples. Think about Achan and who he was and the spiritual privileges he had. This is a man who had been baptized. Okay, circumcised, same thing in the Old Covenant. He'd been circumcised in Joshua 5 at Gilgal just a few weeks before. He'd had the sign of the covenant placed on him. 
He's been marked out as a believer. And this is one who not only had the outward sign of the covenant, think about his privileges. He had been there that day, just a few weeks earlier, when all Israel marched up to the Jordan River as they're going to walk into the promised land. This man, Achan, didn't even have to walk by faith as much as you. He could walk by sight. You've never seen anything like Achan saw that day. Remember, he walked up with the nation of Israel. He walked up to the edge of the Jordan River, and God rolls back the Jordan River like a curtain. It stands up in a heap miles back, and Achan walks across on dry land into the promised land. You've never seen such a sight. Achan had spiritual privileges you can't imagine. This man had the outward sign of the covenant. He'd been circumcised. He'd seen God do mighty things. He'd heard the word of God read regularly. He had marched around the city of Jericho 13 times. He'd seen the walls fall by the supernatural activity of God just moments before he was engaged in stealing from God. Parents don't think, if I just pile up enough external privileges for my children, if they just get baptized, if they just go to Sunday school, if they just sit under the word, it will automatically have an effect. My friend, one of the lessons we'll learn from the lesson of Achan, this understanding should drive us to pray and say, Lord, how I delight in all the means of grace, all the external things. I delight that my child's been baptized. I delight that they sit under the word. But, Lord, I know that none of those things will dent the heart of my child or anyone else unless you sovereignly take out the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. You see, the problem with Achan was just this. Everything was external. All his privileges were external. Yes, he'd been circumcised externally, but not the circumcision of the heart. Here's a man who can have all these spiritual privileges and you'll not see Achan in heaven. Parents, this should drive you tonight to plead with God. God, have mercy upon my child. Use all of these external privileges, but Lord, however you do it, save them. This is a man whose heart was unchanged. And what we will see with Achan, the most troubling thing is, it's possible to be in the covenant people of God and die in an unconverted state. How does this apply to us? I want to make one brief application in weeks to come. We will stack them up. So many applications for us. Brief application. One person's sin can cripple the people of God. We know this principle from the New Testament. Paul tells the same principle, the exact same principle to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5 when he says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. He's saying to them, this sin that you're allowing to fester in Corinth is crippling the entire church. Some of you right now, tonight, are dallying with sin. Willfully committed, strategically covered, resolutely hidden. Could you be the Achan that causes this congregation to grind to a screeching halt? We'll bang our heads against the wall until that sin is finally discovered and purged and dealt with. This text is a call for you to carefully search your heart, to shine the spotlight into the, the dimmest recesses of your heart. Can you pray these words that David prays in Psalm 139? Search me, O God. Know my heart and see if there be any hurtful way in me. What secret sin are you hiding tonight? What worldly habit or relationship are you holding so close to your heart and considering more precious than love to Christ? Oh, if there be any Achans in our midst, may God discover them so his church will not be harmed. Let's pray. Our Father, when we see the sinful proclivities of our own heart, this text makes us run to Christ for salvation, for forgiveness and cleansing. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would humble each of us, that we would not hear this word and point to the person sitting next to us, but we would hear this word, search our own hearts, and be found even this day repenting of secret and hidden sin. 
Oh, Lord, how we praise you that you save sinners. We praise you that Christ came to die for wicked men, for thieves and adulterers, for liars and idolaters. And, oh, Lord, we pray that now, by your Holy Spirit, you would move through this congregation with conviction, that you'd give the gift of repentance, that you'd cause us to cling all the more tightly to Christ so that we might hate sin and love holiness. Lord, give us a deep love for your law and your commandments, a deep love for righteousness, and give us a fearful abhorrence of sin, especially the sin that cripples your church. And so, Lord, strengthen us tonight to repent of sin, that we might go forward and know the victory that is in Christ alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Trinity Psalter hymnal and let's turn to hymn 466. So we stand and sing, Our Faith Looks Up to Thee, hymn 466. now the Lord's blessing and his benediction. May God sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.